You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. It's been two years since Russia first invaded Ukraine. Immediately, when it happened, the Western world leapt to Ukraine's aid. With sanctions against Russia and money, weapons, and technology for the Ukrainian military. Two years later, Ukraine still needs all of those things as the conflict drags on. Those things, however, are becoming tougher to obtain. This conflict still as urgent as it ever was. Still a fight for the future of Europe. Still a battle of freedom versus dictatorship. So if none of that has changed, then what has? Why are people now asking if Ukraine is losing this fight? Why are politicians in Canada and more importantly in America openly wondering why we're sending so much money to Ukrainian resistance? And what happens to Ukraine without that aid? You can see it. You mentioned that aid stalled in the Congress. What are the real world implications of that? Well, on the ground in Ukraine, Russian forces have captured a key city in the eastern part of Ukraine, marking Russia's largest gain on the battlefield in nine months. Two years into this war, something is surely different. What does that mean for the future of Ukraine and the world? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Oleksa Drachevich is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Western University, as well as a lecturer in history at King's University College. Hello, Alexa. Uh, hello. Thanks for having me on. You are most welcome. Uh, I'm going to start with a slightly uncomfortable question, I guess, but uh, I've been hearing it a lot and seeing a lot of reports. Is Russia now winning its war in Ukraine? I think it would be preemptive to say that. I think what has changed, though, is that Ukraine is not winning as well as it could have been. 2023 was a year where I think a lot of people expected Ukraine to break through because 2022 saw these notable victories for Ukraine. And instead, it looks like uh, Russia is pushing back. I think a more realistic assessment right now is that Russia has now had the ability to dig in and develop better defensive positions. Crane is now at a point where it is taking heavier losses, and some of its best trained troops are not either available, have died, or have been rotated out for one reason or another. And we are at a stage where the decision-making being made, not just within Ukraine, not just within Russia, but also internationally with regards to this conflict, are having notable consequences. Why do you think I would hear that narrative then? Yeah, and, and that that narrative is definitely out there. I think it's, it stems from a couple of things. Namely, that there have been a couple of notable Ukrainian defeats, even just most recently, Avdivika being the, the Ukrainian forces withdrawing. That gives this uh, sense of defeat. There haven't been major Ukrainian victories like there were earlier on. Um, it appears very much it's a stalemate, and it's one where there isn't much movement. I always tend to use the term perceived stalemate because there are incremental gains back and forth. Uh, the issue is, is they're not these big motions that I think we, we got used to in 2022 with these very significant swings, first with Russian forces invading in the escalation in March 2022, and then Ukrainian forces pushing back and starting that liberation. I think that part, the, the perceived stalemate, has led to one issue. Um, the other is, is that there is more and more discussion of peace. There's more and more I don't want to say it's a lack of consensus because for many cases, there is still a lot of political will. But the issue is more that some of the cracks that have shown the fact that we're thinking of seeing a significant loss of life, all of that has led to moments where, for example, the Russians have been able to, again, reestablish some of their narratives, gain the right audiences, coming into uh, in the twilight of uh, Putin's very interesting, for lack of a better way of putting it, interview with Tucker Carlson. Right. Uh, there have been a variety of statements from Putin suggesting that, and not just Putin, but uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, Dmitry Peskov, the press secretary, and all of them suggesting that Russia might be willing to end the war. And all of those are have, have led to sort of a, a mistaken idea that maybe this can all come to an end, when really what it is for the Russians is a way for them to consolidate gains at best. But it's also them playing this this game of 
trying to use all of the noise around the war to create or to enhance those cracks in the consensus. So put Ukrainian lack of success, um, at least recently, plus also the fact that it appears that Russia is also rearming and fairly successfully, plus also just the fact that Russia has done a great job of really figuring out what its audience is, especially in the last six months, to deliver a message that can allow those cracks to develop. It's leading to this sense that, well, all hope is lost to really help Ukraine win. Instead, we need to basically help Ukraine survive by negotiating some deal or by turning our attention to giving uh, Russia something to revive things. Plus, also on top of that, we have to also add the impacts domestically in a lot of the Western nations, for example. Inflation remains a significant issue, and that's been enhanced by the war as well. So there's also a general public discourse in which certain narratives are now starting to grab hold and gain a little bit more uh, reverberation in society. And that's the one thing we also kind of always have to have in mind when we're dealing with uh, the Russian government. They are very good at disinformation. And that has sort of, again, allowed them to, again, allow to develop these narratives, but also to then uh, not just promote them, but for them to actually gain an audience. Well, let's talk about those cracks um, that you mentioned. You know, when Putin first invaded two years ago this past weekend, the Western world rallied basically unanimously and with urgency to help Ukraine. I know there is still a lot of aid happening, but is the same urgency still there? How would you characterize the willingness to help Ukraine push back uh, as it gets tougher? I think generally the rhetoric is still there in the sense that virtually every nation that has stepped up after uh, February 2022 remains still committed to helping Ukraine. The political will is where it's starting to wane a little bit. And I think it's come in that there are now differences of opinion of, again, what should we, what should, this, for example, the West ask of Ukraine? Uh, Hungary, for example, has been very big on seeking some sort of peace process. Um, we've seen issues where certain European leaders, for example, have suggested that maybe a negotiated settlement needs to happen. So again, that leads to reconsideration of whether military aid is still the best way forward. Uh, but of course, also then you have um, opposition groups, groups that are not in power or that may now have more power, the Republicans, for example, in the United States, to give one example, where they are now starting to politicize uh, support for the Russo-Ukrainian war and tying it to other issues so they can either speak to their base, they can get progress on issues that they have decided are important to them or to prepare for upcoming elections. Um, in many cases, there are some significant, significant elections in the European Union this year. Obviously, the American election looms large. All of those are other factors that play a role in all of this as well. And I think you've just started to see certain uh, groups tie some of their domestic concerns to this. Again, to give a Canadian example, the Conservative Party's blocking of the Canadian-Ukrainian peace deal over concerns of uh, a carbon tax and liberal climate change policies. But that that's still passed, right? Just to make sure. Yes. But they, they delayed it for a little bit. So again, they tried to use it for their own ends. Speaking of delays, perhaps for uh, a political party's own ends, obviously aid and weapons from the United States has been uh, one of the most significant contributions uh, to the Ukrainian effort. That's been delayed for Canadians who, blessedly, do not have to follow uh, American politics as closely as others. Can you explain uh, what's tied it up and why? So the very simple explanation is that the House Republicans have decided to tie a lot of the funding to other issues, namely border control. And that has led to these types of bills in which there'll be support for Ukraine. This might be also uh, tied to other American initiatives abroad, but also that there will be something to bolster, um, in this case, American defense of their borders, which has become a hot button issue for the Republicans as they gear up for the election. And that has led to these sort of clashes in Congress where the upcoming election has, in, in this case, played a bit more of a role. Well, that was going to be my next question is, you know, it's it's one thing to focus on all the issues and where the money is going in these various bills, uh, which is true with basically any bill, as I understand it, that goes through that goes through the U.S. Congress. But am I wrong to suspect, are people wrong to speculate that this is tied up with Donald Trump's uh, attempt to win the presidency and his, I don't know how the best way to put it, his quasi-tacit support uh, for Vladimir Putin? Yeah, I, I think it's certainly enhanced it. Some of this sort of skepticism towards Ukraine, we'll call it, 
has existed for much of the previous two years as well. Uh, there have been a group of Republicans, for example, that have been consistent in not supporting uh, military aid to Ukraine or uh, otherwise. I think that it's an election year has certainly enhanced it, and it has certainly led to individuals, Lindsey Graham being one, who was very, very notable in his support for any help for Ukraine, to now start to uh, appear to deviate from that, again, perhaps fearing response from Trump, as Trump's rhetoric has also led to a lot of doubt about whether supporting Ukraine is the best way forward. A lot of his sort of off-the-cuff remarks certainly have led to concern about what the fate for American support for Ukraine could be. Um, so that context, we can't really remove from all of this. It certainly plays a role as we've seen Trump's influence over the Republican Party grow, uh, especially in the last year again. Trump recently made uh, as well some comments about NATO. Not for the first time. These were uh, interesting comments. Can you summarize them and what they might mean for the Western alliance, uh, particularly as it relates to, to this conflict that could still yet drag on for years, right? Trump made essentially some comments regarding the commitment of certain nations towards their defense spending, towards their contributions towards NATO, and then made some claim that if any of those nations that aren't meeting the defense spending targets were to be attacked by Russia, the United States would essentially allow it to happen, which is a dangerously reckless statement for a variety of reasons, both in terms of just the American leadership with regards to NATO, but also in terms of just inflaming a lot of fear, especially uh, in certain regions, the Baltics being the obvious example. And so, again, this is where his rhetoric, even if you want to suggest he's just flying off the cuff and just saying whatever comes into his head, again, he was very critical of NATO in his first term. Regardless, you have to take it, take it seriously. And one of the big discussions that is starting to develop in Europe, especially in the last couple of weeks, should Trump be reelected, how does Europe take leadership of its own security interests in the event that a Trump-led uh, United States might pull back from its NATO commitments. Where does Canada figure into that, um, both in terms of, I mean, how committed are we to NATO? I know uh, we don't necessarily always meet our funding requirements, but this is a, a situation which could see us kind of caught between the Americans and the rest of Europe, and, and what, what might we end up having to do? So right now we are meeting roughly about 1.3%. There's a 2% a sort of threshold. We're at 1.3%. This has actually led to a, some notable discussion, um, especially even just recently on Canadian news, where Canada has been singled out for its, put it this way, they have not put in a timeline about how they will meet their funding requirements. This is not a new problem on Canada's part, right? Oh, God, no. No, no, no. Um, and this is something that even a year ago, there was a discussion. Apparently, there were some leaked documents where uh, it was essentially where, where Trudeau essentially said that Canada would just simply not be able to meet them. So this has been an ongoing issue for Canada. That said, they have made some sort of small, notable steps, for example, buying new equipment for the Canadian troops that are stationed in the Baltics, I believe in Latvia, anti-aircraft and anti-drone equipment, which allows them to now finally have up-to-date equipment, something that wasn't always the case. They were often relying on other nations to provide that for them. They have also stepped up in adding funding to NORAD and a number of things like that. Plus, there's support for the Chechia uh, initiative to buy artillery shells and munitions from non-NATO members to provide to Ukraine to allow them to sort of help meet the munitions and shell gap that is developing there. So there are a number of things that Canada is doing. The issue is, is that because they have not met that 2% threshold, it means that they're, in this case, um, getting a lot of criticism for not meeting it. And this is sort of notable in one sense, because as a result and part of the Russo-Ukrainian war, many NATO nations were not meeting their funding goals uh, or the funding thresholds, uh, I believe it was some, only about five nations. That's grown to about 18 of now the 32. So again, many NATO nations have seen the potential threat that Russia could be broadly to NATO nations, and they have stepped up and increased their defense spending. That Canada has not yet done this, this makes them an outlier and a target for criticism. Considering where we are now and uh, what might happen next, what if the weapons and the aid from the Americans don't come? I know that that is perhaps the most critical part of the global aid that's being sent to Ukraine. As mentioned, Republican Congress, pretty unpredictable right now. What if it just doesn't come? 
So there's a number of different sort of scenarios. Scenario one is Europe continues to, uh, they've committed to just to a new um, aid package that will take them for the next couple of years. If Europe steps up, and again, with the defense spending that they have done, in theory, uh, one of the big, and this is the, sort of the big discussion that's happening is, does the Europe need to step up its own defense spending with the idea that you're going to have an unpredictable United States? If they're able to then meet at least the requirements and and to uh, provide Ukraine with enough weapons to continue to fight, that could at least allow Ukraine to at least maintain what gains it has made or at least keep things such that they can meet whatever challenge Russia would be able to provide against Ukraine as Russia is purchasing weapons from China, from North Korea, from Iran. And essentially, they are also have, have turned their economy to a war-based economy to enhance production. They are ready for this to be a lengthy war. Europe has not quite made that shift. That's scenario one. Scenario two is if the United States decides it's not going to be to, to lead this effort, you could see other nations decide this is that that military aid is no longer the way forward and they will transition Ukraine, uh, or at least their efforts in Ukraine towards promoting either some sort of negotiated settlement that will be a very tough pill to swallow for Ukraine for a variety of reasons, which I'm happy to get into or that they simply will not provide the military aid and Ukraine could be left on its own. Where that gets a little bit more complicated is that Eastern European nations, many of whom joined NATO during the 90s and the, and the, uh, the 2000s, seeking to shore up their security guarantees. One of the unpredictable things is if you have a situation where NATO is no longer satisfying those security guarantees, what then happens? And so there's a lot of different variables in which certain decisions could have trickle-down effects, could have a cascading effect where it could also embolden uh, certain other voices, certain other th trains of thought, and ultimately none of it will be good for Ukraine. The simplest way to look at it this way is if Ukraine can get the Western weapons it needs, it can then use the troops it has the most effectively. And we know that Ukrainian uh, military has used, they've showed great adaptability, great resilience, the fact is, is that they also have only a finite resource in terms of the manpower there. And if that bit gets put into a dangerous situation, that is one of the ways where Ukraine could lose. Since it's been two years and since one of the very first actions the West took in response to this invasion uh, was heavy sanctions that have only gotten heavier since that time, how is Russia still so able to fund its military economically? Have these sanctions had any impact? The sanctions have meant that a number of sort of the impact has been often on the Russian people. Western goods have not been as easily accessible. That has also led to sort of, again, we, we have no idea of what the real discontent is in Russia. Um, this is sort of one of those big discussions. Anyone who studies Russia really tries to figure out to what extent do the Russian people support the war? Do we know that at all? So it's hard to say because the the issue is, is this. Is on one hand, there are a notable uh, segment of the population that seems to have certainly supported Putin in some way, shape, or form. Whether it is um, individuals who are answering truthfully on any polling, whether they're speaking the language of the regime, meaning that there's a tacit acceptance of at least the terms of the regime, to individuals who have, we have a number of anecdotal stories of uh, family members turning away their Ukrainian parts to their families and things like this, and clearly speaking the language of the regime. We know that Russian troops in Ukraine, in terms of their actions and the atrocities they've committed, have at least internalized some of the rhetoric that has been going on. However, what, all of, what complicates all of this is that we do know there is some level of, of resistance, whether it is through silent protests. We're seeing it now with Navalny after his murder. It's widely believed he was assassinated, but again, we can only speculate there, as obviously the Russian government will not be forthcoming with those details. And on top of this, you have seen a number of Russians flee. If they were able to flee Russia, they fled, and that is also a form of resistance. Where I come in as a historian here is, is that we also have a wealth of research on populations under, quote, totalitarian regimes, whether it's Nazi Germany, Stalinist Soviet Union, where individuals basically learn the terms of the regime and do what they need to do to at least appear to support it, while at home either resisting or being neutral. Either way, being neutral is a form of support of the regime because it's not actively working against it. All of that is to say we don't know for sure. We just know there is enough support, at least um, in some metric, to suggest that if Putin was to pass away, 
we don't know what would happen. And more than likely, there would still be a, deg a significant degree of ethno-nationalism, at least in the political sphere, which would have all of these trickle-down effects. To get back to the sanctions, it's also such that the Russian government was able to pivot for a lot of um, sort of things, whether it was turning McDonald's into their own version of a russified McDonald's or buying a lot of the um, assets and then just repurposing them to be sort of a Russian offshoot of them to even some multinational corporations of the West are still operating in Russia. So th there are certain issues like that still at play. Where the sanctions hurt is in limiting the travel for a lot of the Russian leaders. And so um, the hope was that it would get to the oligarchs. The oligarchs would then put pressure on Putin. Instead, what we have seen as, say, for example, uh, last summer's Prigozhin rebellion, when nobody really stood up to support Prigozhin, that I think led to a lot of people realizing that Putin has a lot more either influence or that a lot of oligarchs are not going to stick their head out unless they have a sure thing. And so while economically it is hurting Russia, the Russian economy in terms of its actual sort of value is going down, what they've just done is use what they have and you leverage their relationships with some of their allies to allow their production to keep up uh, along with natural resource extraction and so forth to be able to pivot away from any reliance on Western goods and to continue to produce that way. Here's my last question for Canadians and anyone else listening, who over the past two years have seen, you know, just to be honest, this conflict go from number one on the global scale to be replaced with even more pressing disasters, whether that be climate change, the conflict in the Middle East, everything else, <laughs> looming United States election, et cetera, et cetera. What do they need to take away from this conversation or from anything else about what could happen next and where this might be going? Simply put, there's a couple of things. Is that one, a Russia that feels that it can be emboldened and act with impunity will only be bad for world politics in that there is still this idea in some circles, and you see it every once in a while, for example, Olaf Scholz with the, the German leader will occasionally say, well, maybe there might be uh, a way for Russia to get back into Europe. The, the issue is there's sort of this thinking that maybe there's the returning to the world prior to February 2022 is possible. That realistically is gone because Russia has turned itself very much towards developing a multipolar world, aligning itself with China, aligning itself with Iran, with North Korea, along with also trying to enhance its relationship with the global south. So realistically, the world that existed is gone. But a Russia that is aggressive will try to see where it can either take advantage uh, whether it might be, again, should Trump be elected, and let's just say the NATO question comes on the table, would he try something in the, Balti the Baltics, for example, in the sense that would he test NATO? At this point, I think it's unlikely as long as the war in Ukraine um, is showing some of the limitations of the Russian military. But if the support dries up, Putin is just as likely to uh, wait until that support dries up and then try essentially what the Russian forces did in February and March 2022 again and try a, another significant invasion aiming for Kiev. That could be on the table, um, and that would destabilize the region further. That's sort of one of the more pressing kind of broader issues. The other is, is that we know the harshness of Russian occupation in Ukraine. This is an imperialistic war. There is enough evidence to suggest that Russia is at the very least committing ethnic cleansing, if not has genocidal intent. The reports that we know of occupied territory of the tortures, the sexual violence, the passportization, filtration camps, and so forth, suggest there is a very brutal regime developing there. And that is the same reason why peace really isn't on the table for Ukrainians. They know if they don't liberate that territory, that will only continue. And ultimately, do we want to see a power like Russia feel that it can get away with such violent acts and committing atrocities and war crimes when no justice is had? That sets a very, very problematic precedent. It's one that Obviously, we have the discussions have also been made with regards to, um, for example, the United States and some of the atrocities that have been linked to them. We all remember Abu Ghraib, things like this, um, where do we want to see these larger powers be able to act with impunity? That's a way that ensures that we will not have uh, a lasting peace in the world, even if peace might seem elusive at this moment with all of the conflicts going on. I always feel that there's an opportunity that we need to sort of think optimistically and idealistically in the sense that what is the world we're fighting for? And a world where Russia wins is going to make that even more elusive. Alexa, thank you so much for this. 
So thank you for having me on. Oleksa Dracevich of Western University and King's University College. That was The Big Story. For more, of course, you can head to our website, thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find every episode we have ever recorded there. Don't go too far back in the archives or you'll hear me talking really fast. If you want to send us some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. The way to do that is via email, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or with a phone call and a voicemail at 416-935-5935. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.